I represented mm -hmm. the entertainment era. So I was everything that was wrong with the sport. I was the bully <laughs> that you took your kid to martial arts to deal with in the first place. And I'm going, no, there's a performance happening. I still love the quote you said. You're like, you know, I tap and I thought you made, I lost the Bro. round. I was like, that's f***ing hilarious. That is so confusing. <laughs> there are still guys to this day. They'll come to me like they, they crack the code and go, you're not going to get paid on your skills. You're going to get paid by how many butts you can put in seats as though they've cracked a mystery. Hey, <laughs> I remember the day that I had it too. That's not good. That's a fat guy shirt right there, right? I'm sweating while just sitting here talking to you guys. It's hot in this room. I can't believe this. The greatest of all time was nice to me. And I really appreciate that. That's the humility. See, Demetrius doesn't know how we all look at him. He doesn't understand that he's up here. Oh, it's 15 time. World champion, Demetrius Johnson. You're listening to the Body Cast. Uh, Demetrius, can you hear chat one, two, one, two? Yes, I can hear you, but it sounds echoey. Okay. You look great, by the way. I like that backdrop, man. Hey, you're doing a great job. That show is fun, and you're getting picked up. Other media sources, are, 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 are they're quoting you and stealing your pieces. You've been doing great, buddy. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. It's uh. It's a long grind and, um, oh, and thank you for the backdrop. I kind of got the idea from you, like how you, you're in the corner. And I was like, I need to have a, a nice depth backdrop like Shell does. Oh, did you really? oh, good. Yeah. And um, thanks, man. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I love everything you've done. I can't wait to talk to you, man. The fucking gangster. I was gonna like, look, this guy calls himself a gangster and he shows up on time. You ain't no gangster, dog. <laughs> I would never keep the champ waiting. Come on. <laughs> Deal's a deal. You gotta be on time. Uh, hey, by the way, by the way, have you announced, are you... Do, do you and one are you doing another match over there you know i haven't decided yet to be honest with you like I, i'm still under contract right now i've just been focusing on brazilian jiu-jitsu like that's just something i've been focusing on and for me it's just that's what excites me it's like it reminds me of that old days of wrestling in high school where it's like okay you're gonna go you're gonna compete six six matches if you win every single one of them and then you go home right like and not to know what your opponent is going to do it's been very exciting for me. So with that being said, as of right now, I'm focused on jujitsu until, you know, that flame burns out, then I'll decide what I'm going to do. But, you know, what championship they have Brazilian jujitsu, they have no gi grappling. So I can do that. I think when it comes to MMA, like I was literally just taking a nap today and I was talking about, it, I was like, man, like 15 world titles, uh, a definitive, I, I defended a mixed martial arts belt 12 times and four amateur belts. I'm like, what What else is there to do for me in mixed martial arts, you know? So it, it's, it's kind of hard to like say, oh, I, you know, I want to keep on fighting where there's just not that drive and passion. So I think eventually it, it might come to an end. It might come to an end this year. When I when I fought in Denver last year, I told everybody, I was like, this might be my last fight. I was not f***ing lying. I was being straight up honest about that. Well, what 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 an easy transition if you did change your mind. I mean, going from jujitsu and good job, otherwise. I, I saw that monster you had to beat about three weeks ago. <laughs> um, yeah, but I mean, what an easy transition. That's way different than a dude sitting at home doing nothing. The guy can come back. It's like, yeah, it's I'll, hard I'll, to do, hard to come back. Yeah, Mike, are we rolling right now? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Hey, what's up, Joe? What's up, Mike? Look, look, Good to look, see you, buddy. Look what I'm... Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> I saw that. It's, I like that. Old school. Yeah, it's a collector's uh, item now. It is. A, I was thinking that same thing. <laughs> I have one of those, and and you. I don't know. There's probably not five of them out there. <laughs> yeah. Post, post, <laughs> post on eBay for a thousand bucks or something one day. Uh, and and DJ, yes, DJ, you're rolling. I, I just started rolling, so that's stuff in the beginning. You have to take it from Streamyard when we're talking. Oh, okay. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to post your little. Uh, retirement or not stuff anyway so, perfect perfect yeah. perfect good, but good, no good, no good. no we're, okay. we're we're all good yeah no thanks thanks for your time chill and we'll uh i'll take myself off and we'll get rolling okay i have a different opinion man that was a that was a really interesting answer i was interested it was authentic <laughs> I, I think you might have something there people want to know people want to know if demetrius is still competing hey by the way can i ask you one other question then we'll get going two hours later I'm going to start the show. Okay, three, two, one. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? We got a special treat today. We got the original gangster from West Oregon, right down the street, my neighbor. I uh, want to give a huge shout out to Chael Sonnen. Please welcome this man to the Mighty Cash. Chael Sonnen, how are you doing today, brother? Man, I love it, and thank you so much. Now, I, I, maybe this is how the sausage is made, but you and I have been carrying on for about 15 minutes here before you started, and I hope that makes the show. We actually had some very interesting stuff. In fact, we were just discussing one championships, Anatoly, who's a three-division champion, but people mm -hmm. recognizing him on the street, 
it's harder to do. And it's one of those spots where, how do you become a scar? Because for so long, we believed, Demetrius, it was about skill. But we now yep. find out that's not true. There's another side and we don't get to choose. The fan chooses. And there's something to yep. the drama side that used to be left out of martial arts that now appears to be front and center. Well, I think all the drama side, we can thank you for that because there's a point in time in your career where you came up, you showed up, you you know, you didn't wear the glasses, you didn't have this nice little gangster swag. Now you you kind of like paved the way for that, right? Before 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 Conor Gregor, there was Chael Sonnen, and I felt like you did such a great job at it when you had your fights with. Uh, I felt the biggest one was Anderson Silva, and then even John Jones, and then Alicia's goes on. Even now, you know, I saw you just drop a diss track against, you know, the Kendrick and Drake. You're like, I don't know who is this, the defamation you're talking about, Jorge Masvidal. I think we all have to thank you for, you know, paving the way for the drama. That's a huge call. You've never told me that, and I really appreciate that. And you were such a sportsman that I've always thought, I bet Demetrius doesn't like me. Like, I just, just bet he doesn't. Oh, no, He's I such a sportsman. <laughs> he probably looks at me like this picture. And, you know, to be remembered for anything in this sport is not pretty rare, right? I mean, you're in a status as, as the GOAT, but... To be remembered for anything is... So, I, I that means a lot to me. If, if you think maybe I paved the way, and I'll tell you what, I was inspired... And this might surprise you. I always get asked about that Connor or Chael or who is better, something fun like this. But I feel like they're leaving somebody out, which was Rampage. Rampage was mm. the first guy I ever, if I was watching parties in my living room or something, he was the first guy ever where people would tell her, quiet, 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 when it was time for him to do his interview. They wouldn't <laughs> do it all night long. And then quiet, quiet, you want to hear what Rampage said. But moreover, I trace it back personally to Tank Abbott. I thought Tank Abbott mm, was the wow. first ever to come out and do away with some of this honor and respect and make it a little bit more about a uh, a show. And he was more of like a beer drinking. It was a different thing, but I still felt like it started with Tank Abbott. That's just my opinion. No, I, no, I think it's amazing. No, I've never hated you. I thought it was absolutely uh, entertaining. And you had great fights. I mean, the, I work at a, a, a local UFC fit gym and they p played that fight of you fighting Aaron Silva all the time and the pressure and you beating him up on the feet and then you taking a fight to him, right? Like a lot of people, when they fight Anderson Silva, he had this myth, you know, mystical aura about him. But you're like, nah, I'm going to take it to him. And you damn near almost beat him. Like you look at all the scorecards, you're up. It was probably 50, 45, 50, 44, 50, 43. And then he just cut you at the very end. So you've had some amazing fights in the UFC in your career. So I don't think that's going to be the one thing you remember about uh, is you being the forefront of the drama, creating the drama and, and make it more of a show. I think you had some amazing fights. So don't sell yourself short. Jail. I appreciate don't that. Do that. Hey, can I tell you something? I really do appreciate that. Thank you. If I could tell you one thing about that fight, right? And, and when you lose something, sometimes you don't ever want to tell somebody why, because it quickly goes in the category excuse. So then you do the whole, yeah. I'm not making an excuse, but it's like, what? But, but I do want to tell a story. And if it's an excuse, fine. I think it's an interesting story. I had never been five rounds before and I had been scheduled for him. Mm. I had a couple of championship matches with a guy named Paulo Filo in the WEC, but we didn't go all five. So mm -hmm. I, Demetrius, this was the height of exhaustion. And uh, <laughs> I mean, almost like a blur, almost like, like I was so tired, but I was so, I was so determined in that fight. And a lot of it came because I was scared. I, I, I'm deter I've got to do it. I've got an urgency. I got to get him down. I got to stay busy. So the ref lets me stay here. It came from like this urgency, which came from you know, a fear of him. But I'll tell you this, going into the fifth round, my corner tells me it's the fourth round. And I only say that because I, I was up on the score. You, you said I was up on the scorecards when I bring this up. Like, I no longer had to beat him. The urgency to mm -hmm. get him down wasn't there. The urgency to score wasn't there. I just had to beat the clock. Uh, but my, I didn't know that. And I don't know if that would have changed things. I don't know. I mean, a horse a lot of times does a little better when the barn's in sight. I don't know. I did think there was two rounds left. Not one minute left. Mm. Gotcha. Hey, you know, like I said, it is what it is. I still love the quote you said. You're like, I didn't tap. You know, I tap, but I thought you meant I lost the round. round. I was like, uh, that, that's fucking hilarious. That is so confusing. <laughs> There's all sorts of nuances within the unified rule, right? There's glitches and things that, you know, still working out. But by, by any regular standard, I definitely won. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, Chuck, I want to take it to the beginning, right? I always ask my my viewers this. I I'm pretty sure that I know you started in re you started in wrestling when you were you know what middle school, high school child. Um, that was your beginning sport into mixed martial arts, correct? Yeah, that was it. I came, wrestling family came from a family of wrestlers, and my uh, cousins were the guys that I looked up to. My my immediate sibling, I had an older sister, but uh, my cousins all wrestled. My dad was a wrestler. My uncle was a wrestler, even a coach, and. So anyway, I mean, yes, I, 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 I couldn't wait. Could not wait till they finally let me have a singlet. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? This podcast is sponsored by only best energy drink out in the world, and that is... G-Fuel. Ladies and gentlemen, you can try G Fuel by going to gfuel.com, use my promo code money, and I'll save you 20% on G Fuel. My favorite flavor is the Mega Man Blueberry Sushi, but this flavor right here, which is called Blue Ice. Now, when you're taking the G Fuel, I like to take one out of workout and then lift weights. You're getting that extra energy pump. You're getting the focus, and you're also getting the caffeine. That's where the energy comes from. And the cool thing about taking G Fuel, it comes with multivitamins in that bad boy, so there's no crash when you get off of that energy spike. Now, ladies and gentlemen, once again, if you want to try G Fuel, go to gfuel.com. Use my promo code MIGHTY. That will save you 20% on your complete order. Ladies and gentlemen, shout out to G Fuel for sponsoring this podcast. Let's get back to the content. Gotcha. So you, you you went through wrestling, high school, probably college. What was the transition for you going from wrestling to mixed martial arts? Because you went into MMA. I'm sure you didn't do kickboxing, boxing, Muay Thai, or anything like that, correct? Yeah, well, I had, and I had a fantasy, though. So everybody's got rules in their house, and we're probably pretty similar. But but also every family and house has rules that are, hey, this don't do this one. And for my sister and I, do not skip school. And the reason for that is just, if you're skipping, if you're leaving with it, just call us and tell us. We don't want to think you're somewhere and you're not there. All right, mm. fine. So I never did it. I never skipped school. And there was one class. I skipped a class. I went with my buddy, Jeff Williams. We grabbed something called a VHS cassette of something called the Ultimate <laughs> Fighting Championship. And we went and watched it. And I was 17 years old, 1993. And I went home that day. I immediately confessed to my father what I had done. I said, but dad... I found out what I want to do. I found out what I want to spend a, 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 some time in my life committed to. And he was very interested. I didn't get in trouble at all. He wanted me to explain to him. He did not understand. My dad was a wrestler. He's a boxing guy. He did not understand. So I'm trying to explain to him. Dad, there's no rules. These guys are in a cage. He insisted <laughs> that it was wrestling and that I was just a mark, that I, I wasn't understanding what Vince McMahon was doing. I'm like, no, 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 this is not wrestling. This is, they, they're in a cage mm. and they're fighting. And at any rate, I finally had to get him the VHS. And, and I tell you that because that was 1993. And when it was time for me to go to college, I was such a fan at that time in the country. There was six Gracie certified gyms, but only six. Like finding a black belt back then was very difficult. So oh, of these six yeah. gyms, one of them was Pedro Sauer's gym and it was in Utah. So I ended up signing a letter of intent and going out under uh, Mark Schultz at Brigham Young University. And I'm Catholic. Like that was, it was kind of hard to be in a Mormon school, but there was a, a Gracie certified gym that I could get to. So I could, I could cheat and get these workouts. And everybody it was just one one discipline back then. You're a wrestler. You're a judo guy. Yep. So yep. I was going to cheat the system. I was going to get these jujitsu workouts while wrestling at the college and and be all ready when I, when I came out. And uh, it was just one of those things where I thought I was ahead of the curve. But, of course, that, that long changed by the time I graduated. <laughs> well, at least uh, it's kind of fascinating to see that it was the VHS. You skip a school. Getting the VHS, going home, watching it, and you know, tell you that, hey dad, I'm gonna let you know right now. I skipped school, but but there's a positive. I found out what I want to do for the rest of my life. Well, part of my life, and it was mixed martial arts. And that's where that was the infancy start of it, right? Right there. Right there. Right there is where I became a fan and knew that I wanted to do it. As, as I if I got to my senior year in high school, or I apologize, in college. Dan Henderson and Randy Couture were training partners and they didn't have a gym. They didn't have a coach. They had a place that they went, which was a gym that let them in. And then they just got together every day. They'd have a clock and they'd have a sheet and they were super disciplined to do it. And they were the top guys in the country. They were the guys that were ranked number one and expected to go off to the Olympics. So when I found about these workouts, I started showing up 
And I didn't even have the social sense to go and, and ask if I could. I just started showing up. I just started showing And they let me in. And eventually, you know, we all said hi to each other. And I got used to doing this. It was uh, for over a year. So when the Olympic trials were done, I went back to practice at three o'clock like I, you know, Pavlov's dog, like I'd been doing. And they were not wearing shoes and they had gloves and they threw me a pair. And they said, we're, we're doing this now. And there was never a conversation. I went back to that same place every day at three. <laughs> Eventually, we named it Team Quest. Eventually, we we got a guy to come in and go, hey, I want to coach you guys. And the, and the team grew. And we, we even put a sign up and started signing people up. But that is the beginning of Team Quest right there. Dan, Randy, and I tagged along. Wow, that's incredible. That's the thing that I loved about the old school of mixed martial arts, right? Like you said, 1993, you, you guys didn't really have coaches. Rather, he even Matt Hume, he never had a coach. He was just walking down the street in in Kirkland. You know, his dad taught him boxing. He did some kickboxing. He wrestled his whole entire uh, his whole entire life. But when he was walking one day in uh, Kirkland, he said, "Oh, I saw HMC, and it was American Kickboxing Academy." He went there. Then him and the master, you know, he was beating everybody up. Then him and the master at the at the time, Haru. They started sparring hard, and then that's when he was like, holy shit, you're actually pretty good. That's where his Muay Thai. And then you had Maurice Smith. You had all these old guys, and then they would just all train together, and then they would all go off and fight in extreme cage fighting. Like, you almost had the same story. Well, that's everybody's story at that time, sure. right? Besides the Gracies, you know, they just focus on Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and so they had a coach, but you guys never truly had a coach. And those were the guys we looked up to, by the way. It, it was Maurice Smith and Matt Hume, like everybody in the Northwest. Randy Couture, for example, hadn't yep. really got his comeuppance. And I worked out one day with this guy. I'd never met him before. He had no shirt on, and uh, he, he wore a jock. He wore a jock with a cup, but he wore that over his shorts. So, like, when you see him, he's got this <laughs> weird-looking yeah. dude. And he tuned us all up so bad. He was a smaller guy, and his name is Dennis Hallman. And, I mean, he mm -hmm. did things to uh, we didn't know existed in terms of the ground and the jujitsu. And then he verbally abused us as he did it. Like, I went home and told my dad, <laughs> I met the best fighter in the world today. And Dennis Hallman would tell me stories about a guy. So, like, the horror stories that I would go tell my dad about how skilled Dennis was, Dennis would tell me about Matt Hume. And he said, man, you have no idea. And Dennis doesn't call Matt Hume a kickboxer. He calls him a trick boxer. Because Dennis says he, yeah. Matt has, everything he does is he fools him and gets him. He thinks he's going to kick and he punches. And Dennis is not huge on compliments. But boy, he had a respect for Matt Hume. And then you had the Ivan Salvers. You had the Josh Barnett's all coming out of that gym. And I thought Matt Hume formed the AMC. I didn't know that was Heroes. You, you just taught me something. Yeah, that was Haru. Haru was like basically the AMC, like he was just there and he came over from Japan, Hawaii. And then when Matt was just, the story he told me, he was just walking around trying to find a gym to train at because he grew up in Kirkland. He found there and then him, it was like him and Matt kind of uh, formed it. But Haru started it and then Matt came in and basically took over and brought the like the submission wrestling style to that gym, right? Like I'm going to have Matt on the uh, on the Mighty Cast one of these days. I'm going to hear, I don't even know his full story because I'm like, dude, how do you learn all this? And he goes, I taught myself. And I'm like, how the hell you teach yourself? And he's like, I look at people who do good things like Ernesto Hoost, how he would throw the high kick behind people head i will study that and then i'll make it mine and then i'll implement it and so he has a whole story that i haven't even heard about but from when he told me it was haru and then matt came in and then they built this you know amazing team where they would all come together like marie smith ivan salivary <clears throat> but marie smith was a, a very high level kickboxer and then matt kind of taught him some wrestling but they all kind of taught each other and worked with each other Matt, Matt Hume is the is the master even amongst coaches. Like, just for example, if you had a group of very respected coaches and they were arguing about a technique, they were sitting there going, well, you know, I really think your toe needs to go this way and I think you got to extend. Like, if they were arguing and debating it and Matt Hume walked in and said, this is how you do it, the, the argument would stop. And they would all go, oh, well, that, that's how you do it. Told you. It, it, it's one of those <laughs> things. And he was ahead of everybody. And I didn't see, I'm, I'm so curious about the Matt Hume story too because when I got there, he was already there. He knew all the mm -hmm. submissions. And there was a, one other guy, and they ended up having a rivalry. And that guy's name is Eric Paulson, who is now a coach yep. himself. And those two ended up fighting at least twice. But the point was they were so far ahead of the curve in the philosophy in understanding what it needed to be. So then they did start teaching themselves. And that's a real thing. I watched another guy do that. The late, great Evan Tanner 
was out of Amarillo, Texas, mm -hmm. and he used to clear out the coffee table, and he'd get the Black Belt magazine, and once a month they would show a move, and he'd be still shots, and he'd be trying to break it down. Then he ordered the VHS cassettes, and I knew about those because I had the same ones. He went all the way to the, the finals of a world championship with that. When he finally got a gym, he <laughs> won the world championship, but he made it to the finals. Uh, you know, he had it to the title match just off of those VHS in a, in a big heart and open mind. Yeah, absolutely crazy. Like I said, the guys back in the day, they learned how to fight and learn how to teach themselves. So I felt like the depth of like the athletes back in the day, what, I mean, obviously you have kids now starting in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and like my kids, they started at 10 years old in Jiu-Jitsu. So if they get to 37, they stay on the track. They're going to be so much better than, than I would ever have been. But I felt like they, the athletes back in the day, they had to learn and and teach themselves so their ceiling of growth was it it was super high because you can always learn new stuff and you've already taught yourself then you have somebody else coming in and teach you it just even magnifies that makes sense right like when matt would teach me he'd say i'm gonna teach you how to i'm gonna teach you the concept of fighting i'm not gonna teach you okay if your opponent does this you do this and if he does this you do that that's just teaching somebody let's just teach a dog like when i say you know bark you bark so for me, it's been able to magnify my game because like I know how to fight. I know the concept of fighting essentially. So um, I'm glad we see eye to eye on that. But I want I want to fast forward. Right. Talk me to your your pro career. Like I felt like you fought everywhere. You you fought. I, I feel like you fought in Bodog. Yeah. You fought in a, a, Affliction. You, 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 walk me through your your path to where you got to UFC because that was the last organization you fought for. Such good memories, by the way. Bodog, they don't get any credit, but, oh, the memories were great. <laughs> WEC, like, you know, just had the the greatest memories. And then you got your horror stories, too. You got your horror story. In fact, I fought a guy named Trevor Prangley, and it was the biggest oh, crowd. I, I was a lifelong wrestler. Oh, my God. I could not believe how many people came. Oh, I was high on life. I just showed up. There was about 190 people there. But I had never performed in front of this many people that were all watching me. You know, even in a wrestling tournament, you got all these different mats. So it was just a special mm -hmm. environment. Trevor and I had a match, and he submitted me at 7 minutes and 31 seconds of the match. But it was a 7-minute match. The promoter enjoyed it, so he let it just keep going. And when he told us that, <laughs> Demetrius, when he told us that, we did not argue. That is the way that it worked oh. back then. We had no problem yeah. with that at all. And, uh, you know, so you asked me about my path. It was, it was just kind of an interesting thing. And that building we did that in, the, the 190 plus people, something called the Roseland. I did that mm. when I was in college and I happened to have a business class. I wrote a, a paper for the business class about how I could sell out the Roseland. And I have been their exclusive promoter for the last uh, 24 years. We've done 134 shows there with wow. 121 uh, sellout crowds. In fact, you might have heard a, a number of years ago, but we got John Jones and Dan Henderson together. That was just a grappling match. But we're the, yes, we're yes. the ones that hosted that. And so that, that Roseland that used to do 190, now it's a... It's a big deal, at least in this, uh, you know, part of the part of the state or part of the country. And that was just kind of how I started, man. I started as a fan, which is exactly how I end up. That's how I am now. I watched. I came along those journeys. You know, there was they never wrapped your hands, and that was optional if you even wanted to wear gloves. But you know, Art Jemison, we just lost him two days ago. Rest his soul. But I'll tell the Jemison story. He got in there with one boxing glove, but you could. There, there wasn't a commission. Yep. I was on my seventh fight before I ever saw a scale. We would talk about weight classes, but that would get called in a month or so in advance. Your coach would ask you what you weigh. Most guys would lie. They 200 pounds and claim they were 170. You had this whole game going on. And, or even the story I tell you about uh, Trevor where the time just kept going. And so, so then we started to have rounds. We started to have commissions and then started to have weight classes. And when I started, I thought I'm going to have to be able to beat everybody. I was a smaller guy, you know, 165, something like this. And I think, okay, I'm going to have to beat Dan Severn. I'm going to have to beat Mark Coleman because there weren't weight divisions. And then when opportunity started to present itself, the sport also started to form. In fact, Demetrius, before we were on air, you, you were telling a story that a promoter can have so much pull that he can decide mm -hmm. a match, even though maybe uh, that's not the way it's intended to do. <laughs> I had one of those. I had one of those that went for me. These stories always go against you. This went for me. I was nine and two, and Joe Silva had made it very. I mean, if you had two losses, things weren't You're looking very promising, UFC. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Joe Silva had made it very clear, like, if you get another one, you, you, your time of emailing and bothering me can come to an end. All right, fine. So 
I fought, it was called Rumble on the Rock. BJ Penn was putting it on. I was the main event. I flew out there on short notice to take on a guy called Homer Moore. And they gave Homer the win. And BJ Penn's father came in the back, took the win from Homer, right in front of him, paid in cash, gave it to me, and let us all know Homer lost in jail when he reversed the decision. <laughs> and that holds to this day. If you go look at and by the way, Homer did not argue. He let the money go, and he that's the way it went. Like, but that's kind of like the story I was telling you about Trevor. We didn't argue back yeah. then. Things like this happened. So I think that was a bigger part of the story of my career, which is the question you asked. It wasn't necessarily uh, the holds and the techniques as much as it was the administration and the acceptance. Demetrius, when I was in the UFC, I remember getting my hair cut in my hometown, and the gal asked me what I did. And I told her wrestling. And the reason I did that is, too many people before that I had told UFC that didn't know what it was. I would try to explain it, and they would go, oh, well, then you're a boxer. Well, then you're a wrestler. They never got it, and it was to the point that I quit telling me. Now I brag. Oh, I love to say mixed martial arts. I love to say things like this, but I came through the time where it was embarrassing to be associated. Well, I think you came through the time where if you did it, you fucking loved it. Right, you you love the act of combat. You love to test yourself against the best in the world. I'm not saying athletes nowadays don't have the same love, but like you said, there are no rules. You didn't care about weight classes. You either taped your hands, or you didn't. Uh, if the promoter thought you lost, you truly did lose. He takes your, you know, uh, he's like, okay, well, the, the crowd and, and the judges think you won, but I'm taking your money and I'm giving it to who I thought won. And here you go, and you have a loss, and this stays true. Because, like you said, there was no commission back in there, there was no sanction. It might have been sanctioned, but there was no overhead that oversees you, you guys, right? Oversees the promoter. And I think. Those were the best times because you had the true, I'm the one, I'm the one, not the one trick pony, but you just did it because you love that. Then obviously it got, you know, uh, commercialized. We're now with the UFC, you have UFC, PFL, you know, Bellator, one championship, and you have all these grappling promotions, right? So I think when I look back at that time, I wouldn't say, you know, you might at the time feel embarrassed, but I think that was like the, you guys are the pioneers that got the sport to where it is today. Because without you guys, there would not be no, you know, big organizations like UFC and one championship. It just wouldn't happen, right? Could you imagine if you're just like, oh, fuck it. You know, you, Randy, Dan Henderson, whoever else is around, take Abbott. It's like, oh, fuck, this is stupid as shit. We're not getting paid. Da, da, da. You guys didn't care about getting paid. You guys did. I remember Matt, when he, Matt and Eric Paulson fight. He goes, we didn't get paid. We love to do it. We wanted to test ourselves. And that's what got us to where we are today with, you know, the UFC and how and what championship, how amazing the sport is. So thank you, Chell, for going through and feeling embarrassed in your hometown about saying you 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 did UFC. Demetrius, that was beautiful. I don't know if you realize what a big compliment you just gave me or if you meant it that way, but thank you. And, and while you give it to me, you're talking, yeah, this, this entire generation, I look at the Don Fries and the Dan Severs and uh, the Marco Huwaz, as guys that transitioned the sport, Tank yeah. Abbott for that matter. I look at those guys different. And while maybe their skills wasn't the same, I will tell you, Demetrius, I get very cold when guys pull out of fights now. You know, they're asked to go and do it three times a year and all of a sudden, you know, I don't feel good or I'm not going to do it or, you know, I can't <laughs> make the weight class and it irritates me but 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 only because my perspective was so different we used to beg to do it we would but you would never ask about the money you ne you my mother hatched a plan to bribe joe silva 50 grand to get me a <laughs> ufc contract oh and by the way my debut opponent was going to be at heavyweight against andre arlovsky like i was going to get killed damn but still we wanted to be in so bad i give him so much of my life and the internet wasn't a thing it was a very different world back then, but I'm just sharing like, yeah, when, when guys are complaining, they're making 12 and 12 or something on their debut. I'm just not going to feel bad for Demetrius. You, you just missed it. You missed it by about five or six years, but we used to do tournaments and we'd have three guys in one night. And pretty soon the finals started rolling around and there was always a forfeit or you had to bring in a substitute. You, when guys got better, you couldn't fight three guys in a night. So they didn't do away yeah. with tournaments. And the, the way the story goes is they did away with tournaments. That's not true. They just made them four man tournaments. We were still mm. fighting two guys in a night. And I miss those days. Like, in all fairness, the way we do it now is a much better way. But I will tell you, I only had one resentment to our sport, and that was that you only got asked to do it three times a year. Like, like growing up as a grappler like you, it's like, no, come on, please, four and five times every Saturday. And so, you know, three times a year is just... 
It was one of those spots. And so th there is some real positives, like the very uh, nice compliment that you paid me about being one of those original guys. Um, but I also think that my mindset's wrong. I, I think the way they do it now is much better. I think these guys are, are more respected athletes and more organized. I think this is the right way, but I'm still calloused to it. Yeah, 1,000%. I mean, when you look at it now, like when you said, there's a couple of things that I, I, that's how my mindset was, right? Like when that was like, you just shut up, train and keep on winning and the money will come. And then I, th and I feel sometimes if I would have been like, been more hardball, spoke a little bit more, uh, let my personality come out and, 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 and run my mouth. I think I probably would have got paid more because, you know, it was like, I remember when I fought, you know, John Dawson in 2013, beat him. The next thing you know, hey, you want to fight again? I'm like, yeah, let's run it. Come on, come on, come on. Then I got, then I had to pull out that fight, got surgery. Then I turned around and fight him. I fought John Moraga in July in Seattle. And then in December, I'm knocking out Joseph Benavidez. And then I was like, just run it. Run now, it's very rare you see a champion fight as often because there's money involved. There's... They want the right matchup to make as much money as possible for the pay-per-view. Where for me, it's like, man, if I would have taken that route, maybe I would have been a bigger star or maybe I would have made more money. But it, it's it's a, I have some of that old school where I was like, nah, you just fight, you don't care, da da da, da. Now that I'm like at the tail of my career, oh man, and I see all these guys like, you know, Shirk Sean Armani, I was like, I want to fight Ilya. That's that's going to be a bigger fight. You know, I want to fight Ryan Garcia. You know, I'm going to beat it, Marab. They don't want to fight Ryan Garcia. They're, 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 they're boasting the the career and making the check the bag fatter and fatter and fatter. Yeah. So I agree with you. I think today now the way this the sport is structured, it caters to the masses and it caters to the athletes to make as much money as possible. But if they would, you know, I think if we all have the same Italian back how it was in a day, I think the sport would be, I don't know where the sport would be. Yeah. And to me, I know exactly what you mean. And I, I, I came through some of that entertainment side of it. And I have regrets. If I could have gone harder, I could have gone in this direction or here was the right psychology. How did I miss that? I had guys that had a resentment towards me. In fact, I found a very good relationship with Boss Rutten, but we had to sit down and have a real talk because he came through the competition era and I represented mm -hmm. the entertainment era and he was out of the sport by then. So I was everything that was wrong with the sport. I was everything that you're trying. I was the bully <laughs> that you took your kid to martial arts to deal with in the first place. And I'm going, no, I'm really not. You got to give me a second chance here. Like there's a performance happening. And here's what I think it's going to lead to. And it was one of those things where um, there was two different dynamics. And I know exactly what you're saying. And Demetrius, by the way, I'm gonna, I got to bring up a loss that you had. I don't do that to be a jerk. You had, no, you didn't, I had more losses in my first career than you had in your entire career. Like in some ways, it's more interesting to speak about those because they were so rare. But you had the super fight. You had the mega fight. You had the money fight at the wrong time. Demetrius Johnson and Dominic Cruz, it just, you weren't Demetrius yet, and he wasn't Dominic yet. Mm. In fact, I want to say that might have even been your last fight at 35, and they created 25, and you came down. I know I'm real close on that, but I remember yep, when yep. you were getting your run, there was people on the underground, which was running our sport at a time, and it's still effective. They were calling for that fight. That was the super fight. It wasn't St. Pierre uh, versus Anderson Silva. It was Demetrius versus Dominic. And I, I've had this conversation a million times where I told people, it happened. That fight you're begging yeah. for, it actually <laughs> happened. And and here's, you know, what, what was a little different. And everybody has that, though. I mean, everybody has. Maybe a guy beats a world champion, but the guy became world champion three years later. You know, you got to beat him on the right day when he's got the belt. It could change the entire story. But, yeah, man, you has it. You bring up your Do uh, John Dotson matches. Oh, my goodness. He was so fast. And you were faster than him. Oh, my gosh. I remember watching that cage side. I think it was the one that was on Fox. Oh, you guys were so yep. fast. I couldn't even see what was happening. Dodson was so tough. And I love that you mentioned Joseph Benavides because when 125 story gets told, it's Demetrius Johnson and Henry Cejudo. But people, there's a third guy. Joseph Benavides yep. deserves to be met. It's the three of you that changed that division, not just the two of you, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that let's take a step back with the Domino Cruz fight. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I fight at 135. And that weight class was just too damn big at the time where I was at in my life, right? Like, I remember coming home, getting ready to fight Domino Cruz. I was weighing like 138. And I'm like, well, it is what it is. Where you're fighting a guy who's, a, you know, at the time, a better wrestler, better at footwork. I can't get to him. I'm trying to kick his head off, right? When I when I take the way Domino Cruz moves when me and him fight and I look at when Chito Vera did to him, same high kick. I, I've thrown that same high kick in that fight when I fought him. I just missed it. Cheeto landed it. And so I felt 
felt like my skill set wasn't ready for that fight at that day. And he was just, he was way better. I mean, the man fucking suplexed me four times in that fight. So, I mean, what, what, what can you say? Um, and then to jump forward, you look, they made the 125 pound. 125 pound division in the UFC where me, Joseph, e, even Ian McCall, you know, and John Dotson, those guys were the pioneers of that division. Now all of us aren't in the UFC anymore. You have your new guy like Alex Pantoja, Kai Kai France, um, Alex Perez, uh, a lot of good guys who, who kind of carry in that flag. But yeah, and, and you know, I did have an opportunity to fight for, you know, a super fight with TJ Dillashaw, but there are things in their contract. This was the first time I had you know, I, a leverage that I'd asked for in the contract and we just didn't come to eye to eye and they weren't going to pay me. Like, what's the whole point of a super fight? You're going to get the same amount of pay, right? And for me, that's why I, I think that fight never happened. But, you know, I think me going on and doing 11 title defenses, going to one championship, doing what I did there, kind of submitted my legacy as one of the best in the world at Flyweight in America and in Japan as well. Yeah, and how many in a row is a big deal too? You know, when you got to 12 in a row, that was a really big deal. John Smith from the wrestling era, We've had other six-time world champions, but John did them in a row, and it's what it's yes. what sets him apart. Everybody calls him the best ever, myself included. It just matters. Those, those little things that you never think of, these little goals that you were never chasing, but you uh, accumulated on the way. I mean, I really think that that's the part uh, that separates you. And I feel a lot of guys get so close to their own career they can't stand back and see. I, I'm not sure that you are aware of how we, the community, views you. You 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 are the guy. Like there's never been a Mount Rushmore ever that didn't include Demetrius Johnson. There's never been a 125 pound ever where he, you're not the absolute number, not an argument, number one ever. So uh, I think that your humility though is what has allowed you to last. I I I don't think guys in your shoes would go out to a jujitsu tournament that they got to pay seventy five dollars to enter. Oh by the way, <laughs> they're very likely to lose considering th there's weights and that's not what they're fully focused. I mean I'm just sharing like you have that different. Mentality, and I think a lot of it has to do with remaining humble in spite of everything. It, it, it seems as though you know you remain humble. A lot of guys get big for their britches. You like them or so. They they get a little a little money or a little fame. You can't even stand to be around them. And it didn't happen mm. with you. It seemed like the opposite. The the big sponsors, the the Xbox three six, they were coming to you. They they were looking to attach. Yeah. By the way, Demetrius, I got to tell you something. Random thought. Random thought. But I haven't got to talk to you in a while. Go ahead, baby. I told you. The first time I cut class, watched this, went home and told my dad. When I was explaining mm -hmm. to my dad what this was, he was convinced without seeing it that I was watching professional wrestling and that I was just being fooled. If I would have brought my dad your matches home, he would have been sure that I was being fooled. You were doing video game style techniques <laughs> that do not look real. Like human beings don't do them. I know everybody asks you about it, but when you Matt return into an arm bar, like, oh, come mm -hmm. on, man. Like, come there. If my dad would have seen that in 1993, he would have been positive I was watching wrestling. He would have been positive it was scripted. Yep, yep. He was like, that shit's fake. There's no way a man could throw a man in the air and catch his arm and break it on the way down. There'd or even no that a way. guy would that's, do that when there's only a few seconds left in a fight that he's dominating. The guy's not going to take any risk. Yep. Well, Demetrius was. <laughs> See, and this this is one thing. One, thank you so much for that compliment, man. And that's the thing that I I sit back and, and I think about like where the sport has gone from today. Well, excuse me, back when I was fighting, or even you, to where it's today, right? You just said it like Max Holly was beating the bricks off of Justin Gaethje, and then at the very end, he was like, "All right, motherfucker, now nah, I'm gonna really whoop your ass," and he finishes him. And then I was like, "Oh man, Max Holly, he didn't have to do that." You go back to when I fought Ray Borg. I did the exact same thing, beating up the whole entire time. And I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. I guess I'll just throw you up in the air, catch your arm. Then you look at when Alex Pereira got kicked in the balls, pushes off Herb Dean. Like, Herb Dean, you good, dog. I got this. Ends up knocking out Jamal Hill. Fast, go back in the pass. I'm fighting John Dotson. Beating him every single round. I get kicked in the balls. And I say, don't worry about this, Herb Dean. There are no breaks. Let's keep on fighting. Now, granted, I didn't go off and finish John Dotson like... Alex Pereira did, but it's almost like history repeats itself. But the one thing that we didn't have, or well, I didn't have, was I didn't have the power of magnitude of social media, how fast things catch fire, how things go viral. And I want to talk to you about that. Like, what do you think is it? Obviously, it's technology, but what do you think it is today that people have done what people are doing now? And people have, are, have done what people have done in the past, and they're doing it now, and everybody's like, oh, Oh my God! Did you see that? Of like, 
dude, Chell Sonnen did it like, you know, 18 years ago or 15 years ago, right? Like, what do you think it is that makes it so go viral? Is it just the technology now or is it where the sport has gone? I have laid in bed at night trying to figure out that question. There's books written on that. And I mean, it's one of those things where you really don't know. You throw as much out there as you can and hopefully something sticks. The technology is absolutely fascinating. Demetrius, uh, when I was a kid, I would read about guys, heavyweight boxing champions, and some of them only weighed 180 pounds, things like this, but they were the heavyweight boxing champion for 10 and 11 years. But the way you would watch boxing back then, including your opponent, was huddling around a transistor radio. You didn't get to watch it mm. at all unless you happened to be there live. So now you don't have a coach that's breaking it down. You don't have a coach that's rewinding and scouting things. It was a lot easier to hold on to that belt for a decade when nobody knew what mm. they were getting into. I think of Lyota Machida, but at the time he was so tricky that if there was no videotapes, I, I feel like I like Lyota would have just kept on putting guys to sleep. You know, you get one shot at this. It was hard to even bring in a workout partner for training camp. They could do some of the stuff he was doing. Steven Thompson, some of these guys with this unique skill set. I think you, I think Conor McGregor might even fall into that. My point being, like, when you bring up technology, yeah, I, th I think that it's really big. And then there's some slippery slopes, too. Like Dana White fully embraced social media. He's the one that taught us what Twitter was. He sent everybody for Christmas yep. one year. He sent everybody uh, <laughs> video cameras. And, and the next year, he sent them the, 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 the laptop so that they could could upload videos. And I'm, I'm just sharing, he even, there was paid incentives for whoever could get the most Twitter followers per quarter. Yep. NBA, meanwhile, at the exact same time that Dana was doing that, begged their players, do not download this app. Do not post and do not go on there. So it, it was a very different thing. Dana went against the grain a number of times. And the accessibility of his athletes to the audience was extremely unique and still is. That's still not one that, that all organizations are willing to embrace just because they know of the risk uh, that that could cause. And, and MMA really made it as far as it did, uh, in large part because of the accessibility. Because, you know, as you're an everyman. The, the crowd could really relate to you. There you are. There they are. You're walking out. You know, what's the difference? It was one of those things in MMA. Like when you study the history of it, there, there's a few things that we did different. Yep. Well, and it's like the viewers, a little uh, context about what Chell just said. So when uh, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook first came up, uh, came out, the UFC would, uh, I talked about in one of my recent videos about UFC Fighter Summit. He would bring us there and say, you guys need to build your brand. It's free. It costs you nothing. The more people want to see you fight, the more money you're going to make because you're going to make money and pay you points, et cetera, et cetera. If you became a champion, you become a partner. I've done a video on that already. But he was very, the UFC was very good about doing that. And then, yes, you'll send your laptops. And then they will give you incentives. I think it was like quarterly incentives. Like whoever had the most traffic in their thing would be like, First person will get twenty five thousand. It'll go like twelve thousand, and then five thousand, and maybe you know a thousand dollars. So they give us a lot of incentives to talk about the fights and boast it. And they kept on doing it for I think it lasted for maybe a year or two years. And then you know fast forward to what it is today. I think they 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 seen the payoff of them slowly you know investing in telling the fighters to do that. Like I'll never forget at the UFC Fighter Summit, they pulled up a picture of Cain Velasco. I was like, you see this man? This man is Mexican-American. We are trying to break into the Mexican market. So we want this man to do very, very well. You need to follow this man's footsteps and trying to get your community behind you. That way it brings more eyeballs to the sport. And at that time, they were trying to break into the Mexican market, the Latino market in the UFC. And Demetrius, that was such a foreign concept. I remember that meeting. I know exactly everything that you're talking about. We they, they had the IT people in the back. Hey, on your way out the door, yep. stop by. <laughs> they'll sign you up. And, and I did it just because Dana Lorenzo were watching. I didn't know what they were talking about. There was nothing about it. Dana did say one thing that caught my interest at that time. This was what was this 2009, maybe even 2010. But he said, your 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 window's gonna be small to fight, but if you if you can go and build this thing called social media, you can take that with you. So if you want to sell some t-shirts or an autograph down the road, you'll have an audience to do it to. And I had no t-shirts, and you know, we had there was no audience down the road, but I just remember he said that and thought, okay, investment in the future, we'll we'll see what it turns of it. And Demetrius, because you brought that up and we brought up the pay structure, there are still guys to this day where this light goes on in their head. 
and they'll come to the media. They'll come to me like they, they crack the code and go, you're not going to get paid on your skills. You're not going to get paid on your win. You're going to get paid by how many butts you can put in seats as though they've cracked a mystery. And all, and I, I, <laughs> hey, I remember the day that I had it too. I remember the day thinking I've got this big revelation and I know the secret that Dana and Coker are keeping from all of us. No, they were never keeping it from us. In fact, the pay structure of MMA doesn't go Dana White, Scott Coker. It goes Dana White, Joe Rogan. So who's never thrown a punt, like the words <laughs> matter and we should know that. And you brought up that pay for Twitter. I won that twice and it was $5,000 and $5,000 when you're not owed it. Oh my God, that is so much money is the most ex exciting thing. That means I never threw a punch. I tweeted out some words. I fought Babalu Sabral. I got $2,000 and we had to pay our own medicals. My check was mm. $100. I kept that check to this day. It was pinned up on my refrigerator. I said, you have the ultimate fighting championship or Zufa, $100. And I kept that as a, a motivation forever. But could you imagine you send out a tweet, you get five grand, you fight Babalu, you get two. Like there's a real lesson yeah. there. Words matter. Attention matters. Yep. They gave us all the clues, Demetrius. We just didn't quite see it as fast as they wanted yeah. us to. Yeah, that's crazy. Like I always tell people, I always tell my my friends and my wife, I was like, any check I can get without getting punched in the face is a good check. It's a good check because I'm getting paid for not, you know, me, me being in the gym, training hard and fighting, but by me being a personal person and going to shake some hands and, and doing whatever it may be, meet and greet, a seminar. Because when I do seminars, I'm not getting punched in the face. I'm teaching a passion. I'm sharing my passion with fans and other martial artists. And I, I agree with you. And this is where it leads for my different my, my next segue uh, about you, Chael, is you have been able to transition from um, not a whole lot of people have been able to do it. Not a whole lot of people have been able to do it. You have been able to transition yourself from a professional athlete to one of the best analysts, one of the best content creators on YouTube. You hold no allegiance to nobody, right? You talk about karate combat. You talk about boxing. You talk about whatever it is on your mind, whatever gets the West Side gangster thinking. You talk about Talk me through that navigation, that game plan. Like, what made you do it? Like, now I'm almost at the same thing where I talk about whatever the fuck I want. Right, like if the, if it intrigues me, I talk about it. If it's not, I don't talk about it. But you, you know, you talk about you don't have any merchandise now. You know, the producer Michael Wands over, he's got a you know a dynasty hat on that you started with Eru Hawani, the good guy, the bad guy. Talk me through this process. What made you go down this route of being being the best analyst and content creator in the game? I got to tell you that I, mean, I really appreciate that. Um, one thing about I never I I. I Sometimes a broken clock is right twice a day. Sometimes you get it right and then you you rework it. Like every business book ever written is a guy reworking history to act as I knew if I did this. And I was like, that's not what happened. You created, you put yourself in a position and it turned out to work out. And that was kind of my, I just wanted to be involved. And in our sport, it is so hard to participate if you're not throwing the punches or having the punches thrown at you. So I was just trying to be involved. When I started a podcast, I thought it was two words. I thought it was pod space cast. That's how little I knew about it. Uh, voice only, Demetrius, never even thought about putting it on camera, uh, doing anything like that. So it was one of these things that just evolved. And I still haven't got to where I'd like to be. Like, you know, Joe Rogan is, of course, the master because he makes the most oh. amount of money. But one thing that Joe can do, man, it doesn't matter if he's talking about cage fighting. It doesn't matter if he's talking about the moon landing. He can go in any direction. And there's not very many people that can do that, myself included. I've tried a little bit. And I can do boxing, wrestling, fight, but it kind of has to be that. I've tried to do movie reviews and food reviews, and it's not what people want me for. They, they want me to kind of talk about combat, and that's okay. I, I feel like I'm, I'm broad enough that I always have something to say, but, I mean, there is really an amazing thing. I'll go back to Rogan, but there is an amazing thing that he can talk about anything with anybody and get people to listen. Come on, man. That's mm. hard to do. Yeah, it is. Trust me, I know. We've been trying to. Do, that's the thing. I've been trying to really uh, broaden. You know, the mighty cast is obviously our our fan base is mixed martial arts, like you said, combat. And and for me, I'm such a nerd. I love gaming, and you know, I've I've had another guest on. We haven't dropped that video, but I think one of the things I try to take from Joe Rogan is that you talk about what makes you passionate, and then hopefully your viewers will turn over and enjoy the conversations you have with the other 
guests you have on the show, right? Because for me, I, I always like some of the stuff you be talking about. I sit there and I just like your mannerism. I like the way you, you think and how you uh, project the information because it's hilarious. And you've also done some acting too in some movies. I've seen a little bit of that as well. So I think you doing it, I think if you were to slowly start sprinkling in a little, you know, movie reviews, like, I think, I think you'd be surprised of like the numbers you would get and over I, time. I'm not going to say overnight, you're going to have, you know, a million, a, a million views on, on the video or on the podcast or the downloads. But I think, you know, think about it. How long did it take you to build your YouTube to where you first started to where it is today? How long did it take you? Five years, F five years to have something that you could actually count on that people are going to listen to. By the way, I got to give you disclosure here. So your producer, Michael, kind of told me some of the things he'd like to see for today because you have a high quality show. Bringing a dog to set would not be on Michael's list, but I must explain. To me, I have two dogs and I've only had three in my whole life. I, I lost my first one and the second dog I got speaks English. This guy knows like 18 or 19 words. You can tell and he will do it. And I mean, right away, you open the car door and you tell him get in or you tell him get in. He just knows what to do. So I got the same mm. breed. And that was a coincidence, but I ended up with the same breed. And this little girl is still a puppy. She's she's 10 months. She she doesn't know the 17 words. She doesn't know seven words. She doesn't know. But but I've always, she's had to learn from the other dog. So, so now I'm taking her mm. alone. Just her and I one-on-one. -on -one. This only started four days ago, but I am seeing improvement. And uh, so, so I think, you know, if I can get her to listen to me as opposed to to watching the other dog listen to me, this is my thought. I'm not a wonderful dog trainer. Yep. I've only had three dogs, but I'm trying. And I wanted you to know why I have Miss Rosa uh, popping into our shot a little bit here. She's very sweet, but she's very shy. <laughs> and she's, she's still learning a little bit. Hey, by the way, did you get called out? Did you get called out by Mikey Mussolini? Somebody challenged you to a grappling match and you put him over. You actually go, oh man, that, that dude's awesome. But was that Mikey? <laughs> Yeah, that's Michael Misumichi. He he did call me out. He wanted to uh, do a grappling match, and we actually, me and Chacha, we actually talked about making it happen. Um, we just we couldn't come to terms on the contract because for me, it's a business. I look at now when I fight and I compete, I look at it as a business. If it's something I don't truly want to do, it's a business. It's a business opportunity for me, business opportunity for the company. And so we just shouldn't come eye to eye with that, yeah. especially as me with my mixed martial arts. Now, when I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and IBJJF at the tournaments, that's something I want to do. That's something I want to try. I, I get excited. You know, as we said earlier before we started the show, I get excited going to a tournament, seeing my name in a bracket, and there's 45 people in the bracket. And there can only be one champion, only one. That excites me and just the gauntlet and the grind, which Mikey Misumichi, all the great grapplers, Marcus Buchecha, all those guys, the Rotola Bros, they've already done that stuff, right? Now they're starting to compete on the biggest stage of grappling in one championship where I've been doing that since in 2000, uh, 2010 when I fought for WEC, UFC, and one championship. Now it's like... I get to go back and back and do my jujitsu tournaments where I it feels like I was in high school going to a wrestling tournament and wrestling six dudes and be like oh, I'm the champion. I I prevail over 45 45 people. So the fight didn't come to materialize, but you know he's still young. I'm still young. It, it could happen down the road, but we'll see. You know I don't I don't budge on my numbers, well, so we'll uh, Dimitri, see what he, happens. He clearly was very wise for calling you out. I mean, if he got your attention to the point that we're talking about it two years later and you had a meeting with Chaudhry, like. That was a smart move by Mikey then, right? I mean, he's calling out the guy. You don't generally call out yeah. somebody from a, a lighter weight class. I mean, there was a little bit of risk there. So so good for Mikey. Hey, I'll tell you what. One championship has a chance to save uh, grappling. I mean, grappling is one of those things. You and yeah. I love it some other people, but they are bringing the spotlight. They are bringing uh, the incentive. It's really a, a uh, cool thing they're going. You talk about tournaments. I did them my whole life. I took them for granted. I never saw the guy in the mirror and was proud of him. Like, that's just what you did on Saturdays. But now that I am an adult, particularly a, a father, there is something so special about a tournament. I, I watch these guys, to me, just that won't go out there and, and do a fight that's three months away. And I, I think, but, but wait a minute. In a tournament, 
we don't know who we're going to have because we don't know who else is showing up. Mm-hmm. Oh, by the way, once we do know who showed up, <laughs> 40 minutes later, you're getting a brand new guy till you go through five or six of them in a row and you don't know who that's going to be. You don't know how you're going to do. You don't know what they're going to do. Are you going to this side of the bracket? It's one of those things. And there is a massive courage. I never saw it. I never credited myself or you or anyone. I just tournaments is what you do on Saturday. There's a massive courage to going into a blind tournament oh by the way not only are you giving up your time you're you're the one paying to enter there is a massive yep. courage to that and guys grapplers and wrestlers and jujitsu guys man i wish they got a little bit more praise because i think they deserve it well not just praise but more money you know i think you know craig jones he's been really advocate for this like Scott. i think he's about to do a tournament that's going to pay two million dollars Oh, and not, I'm not too sure about like, the whole like logistics of it. I want to talk to him about it, but I agree. I think the, the jiu-jitsu scene. One, I got to hear more. One night tournament? I don't know. I don't know. I, okay. I got to find out more. I follow him on social media. Sure. I've been talk, I've been going back and forth with him, but he was like, you know, for him, he's like, why are all the promoters making all the money when people are coming to see us grapple? He goes, it doesn't make sense. He goes, we need to be making more of the money. Kind of like in mixed martial arts. Right. Like we always talk about, like, you know, you look at, you know, the pay stub of what the UFC makes or, or, or an organization. And it's like four billion dollars this 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 year. And you look at the, what the athletes get paid. It's like maybe not even, you know, two percent or whatever. Like he's kind of taking that lead in like the jujitsu where he's like, dude, like us athletes need to start making more money. He goes, why does it make sense? And that's why he's doing this stuff with the karate combat. And he's doing, you know, who's number one and all these other ones. He's basically going around being in my eyes a nomad where he's like I'm gonna fight here and make 20 G's I'm gonna fight here and make 10 G's I'm gonna fight here and do this and this instead of you know signing up so I'm gonna find out I wanna talk to him more about it but I agree with you I think jujitsu practitioners need to get paid more money and I think one championship is doing an amazing job setting setting the forefront for that because the Rotola brothers Mike Misumichi Shane Aoki um, you know there's a lot of guys who are making good checks over there just grappling I, I name dropped earlier that I was the promoter for for John Jones and and Dan Henderson. But one thing about that when I when I got into grappling and Craig Jones, I, f- I feel like maybe I was one of the guys that helped to discover him. He went on to be our uh, big face of Submission Underground, including uh, during COVID. Mm. The number two watch grappling match of all time. Number one watch is the final match between Bachecha and Hodger Gracie. They ended up doing a gi match, but the number two yep. match ever watched was Craig Jones versus Vinny Magaliesh. It was the first sporting event. When COVID hit, it was the first period, tennis, golf, it was the first sporting event back. So they had a couple of things that helped them, but I just, I'm just name dropping Craig Jones. One thing about it, when I would go to those events, Demetrius, it was the most uh, family friendly. You'd have grandma and and she brought her kid and, and they got the grandson bouncing on the knee. There was no tension. These guys weren't nervous and pacing downstairs and slapping themselves in the face. It was a very different, very, just a very different attitude. It was wonderful, quite frankly. But it surprised me because I'm going, wait a minute. Do you not understand the rule set? This is the most vicious rule set I know. You're only encouraged to do two things. Strangle a guy unconscious or break something. You're not encouraged. Yep. There is nothing else you're encouraged to do. There's no 10-9 <laughs> must system. There's no doctor that's getting like, this is vicious. These grapplers that go in there, oh my God, this is vicious stuff. Particularly the way that Craig Jones plays with all that leg stuff and the ankle manipulations, you know, coming through uh, John Danaher. Mm-hmm. When you talk about the threat that they're taking on and the courage, I am with you. And it needs, to, and it's not understood. It's not appreciated. If it was, I think it would be paid more. Yeah, and and what they're going, what they're attacking when they talk about the leg locks, they're talking about the heel hooks. They're trying to tear each other's ACL, MCL. That's like a nine month recovery and surgery. It's not like you know, like that's a thing that it blows my mind. It's like okay, we're gonna do heel hooks. All right, good luck. I hope your knee doesn't snap. I'm like, you're not touching my fucking knees. Like I'm gonna tap so fast because <laughs> I have to go to work and create content on Monday. So you're not touching my fucking knees. Um, it, it's just crazy. And I think those guys, I think eventually if you look where the UFC started, not UFC, but mixed martial arts in general, you know, 1993, it's the infancy stage. You jump, what, we're 21 years, am I math correct? Yeah, 20, yeah, 21 years. Now athletes are starting to make, you know, really, really good money, like life-changing money. So I think jujitsu, I mean, even though jujitsu has been around a lot longer than mixed martial arts, I think commercialized it needs more, and I think it will get there eventually, especially if athletes start talking about it and, you know, my black ass is play, paying to go compete at IBJJF, so we'll see. Demetrius, f- finding out the gap between 
2024 and 1993. Like, that's impossible to do. That can't, that can't actually be done. But there's going to be people in the comment section that are going to argue it's 31 years. So let's just get that out of the way before they start doing <laughs> now, No one knows. No one knows for sure. Like, that's going to be debated till the end of time. But there's some people that are going to think we, we missed a decade there. Yeah, my bad. My math is off. Hey, I, I've got five hours of sleep. I just literally got home. The time of filming this station, I literally just got home from Hawaii and I traveled with three kids. We took a red eye. And so imagine that flying home four, four to five hours of sleep. You get home, get on a pack, kind of set up all this beautiful light for chill sun. And so I apologize if my math is off what? a little bit. Okay. I picture you as about five hour guy. What, what, what's your number? If you have a, no kids, what's your number? Oh, eight hours. Oh, really? eight, eight and a half hours. Really? See, oh, I my am God. Too. Oh. I am, and you don't get to choose well, I, that as a person. God chooses that. And I, my number's higher, too. I wish it was small. I wish I was five hour guy. Yeah. My wife, she could do five. She could do four. Like, she'll go to bed like 10 o'clock at night, wake up at 4 30, go to the gym and fucking run like five miles, lift weights for two hours, sit in the sauna, come home. All right. You got lunches done, baby. Let me get these kids to school. Me, I'm like, don't fuck up my sleep. I'm going to bed at 10, and I'm waking up to 7.30 or 8 o'clock. Do not disturb me. But last night, I didn't have that option. What is happening, Michael, by the way? We're old friends. We actually go back. Michael, nice to see you. No, Chad, like you said, old old friends. Aaron, the bad guy, had had to represent today. Beautiful. Um, and I, don't, I also wanted to give you a chance to, to, to plug uh, for my old ESPN friends. You got a new ESPN show. Um, it is good, good guy, bad guy. What is it like having DC as a co-host inst instead yes. of Ariel Hawani? Yeah. Well, I wouldn't accept that. I, <laughs> when I accepted that job, I thought it was called bad guy and the other guy, like the Chael Sonnen show. And then, you know, I have Daniel as a guest. Apparently he's like an equal partner in it, which I didn't know, but thank you for giving his, <laughs> his pronoun Cormier. Dan Cormier, he was a UFC fighter at one time. This guy, he was a pretty good wrestler. And thank you for, for bringing that up. But what was the question? Oh, what's it like? Hey, I like it over there, man. I, I was telling Demetrius earlier, but it's hard to participate in fighting without fighting. And uh, I'm a fan. I was a fan in 93 when it started. My career will end as a fan. And if I can be part of the discussion, man, I consider myself very lucky. I actually like that. That's a beautiful. That's a beautiful uh, phrase. Like I started as a fan and I'll end as a fan, and you don't see it as a negative connotation. You see it as a beautiful thing because you started as a fan, and like you said, the only way you can participate is by throwing punches or fighting and actually doing that. But as we get older, we can't do that anymore, right? But we still, we still love the sport. We still see things as an analyst standpoint where people who have never fought a day in their life that like to hear from us. So I'm gonna have to run with that. I started as a fan. I'm an in as a fan. I'm and, gonna true, take that and, and true, that right? Up. And I kind of stole it from a version of something that Nate Diaz said. And Nate Diaz said, I'm only going to be a fighter for a period of time, but I will be a martial artist my entire life. So I kinda, it was that, that same theme, but I think it makes a lot of sense for a lot of us. Before we let you go, want to get your take on some some hot topics that are out there right now. One that I kind of want to know your opinion on. A lot of people talking about John Jones um, and who, who he should be going in against in his return fight in your opinion who would you want to see him go against Stipe that's the fight that he wants that's the fight UFC wants or would you rather him see Aspinall or even something crazy if he fought uh Pereira at heavyweight it, it, I'm gonna chime in on this too but go ahead y'all yeah. let you go first and guys if, if I had my choice I think I would match John up differently and I think it's out of respect to his greatest I would try to get him beat I mean we've been trying to get him beat for years because <laughs> it's the one thing we haven't seen We've seen him win. We've seen him dominate. We've seen him choke people and, and knock people up, but but we haven't seen him get beat. So yeah, I think I would, and, and and maybe size at some point, if not father time. But very hard to do, man. What a skilled guy. I did not understand on a personal level how big Stipe versus Jones is, but they did a little poll internally, and apparently that's the, they're claiming that's the biggest fight that they can make. Apparently, when that was originally signed, tickets were gone, and media partners were coming in. I don't see it that way. I want to see it. I think it's a great fight. I was surprised that the UFC found that to be the biggest fight they could currently make. That surprised me. Well, I think it comes from you have, you know, John Jones, like you said, one of the greatest of all time on my list. He's never been beat, you know, besides the Mark Hamill thing. He was beaten to Liverpool, but it was disqualification. But he's beat everybody. Leo Machida, Rampage Jackson, he beat you. The list just goes on. Now you have a guy like Stipe Miocic where everybody believes Stipe Miocic is the greatest heavyweight 
uh, world champion in the UFC. And granted, he hasn't fought since he got knocked out by Francis Nagano. So it's been a long, long, long time. Michael and the, and the fans can correct me if I'm wrong. But that's the that's the memory that comes that pops up in my mind. So you have John Jones taking on Stephen Miocic, but you have these other killers like Tom Aspinall, who's a champion, who's an interim champion. Typically, when you're the interim champion, that means you're going to be fighting for the belt next, right? And so for me, I want to see John fight Stephen because I feel like those are two old guards and you have this new generation. And John Jones just came out recently and said, I think I'm going to fight Stephen Beers way more there. Like Stephen Miocic is a household name. We don't know where Tom's going to be in two to three or four years, right? But I guarantee in two to three to four years, we are going to remember Stephen Miocic, right? And I think John Joe's doing that. I think I think they could say, John Joe's, we're going to strip you of the belt or you could vacate it and we'll let uh, Tom Aspinall and somebody else fight for the heavyweight championship. And John Jones and CBA can fight for the baddest heavyweight motherfucker in the world. Who, who knows? But I don't think they have to hold down the division for that fight because we all know. And here's the thing. What if John comes back and beats Stipe, which I I am foreseeing that? Then John Jones is like, you know what? I'm still young. I'm going to fight Tom Aspinall, right? Then you even have a bigger mega, uh, a, a mega fight. So it's a very interesting way how to view that fight. I think it's a great fight, but... I think when it's like the world championship and you have Tom Aspinall waiting, that's where it kind of gets a little murky. Can I jump in on one technicality, Demetrius? People seem to be missing Absolutely. this. This hasn't been tested yet, but let me just call it out for the smart mark that's like, I know these kinds of things. You got Ta Tom Aspinall, who's the interim champion. We make up yep. the rules as we go on the interim championship, but one thing that you and I know for sure is that means you're the number one contender. Well, yep. not so fast. We're now going to have an interim champion not facing the undisputed champion. Why keep him? That why, why why keep John with the belt or why keep Tom with the belt? Well, here's the the answer. We don't know if John is going to return for one, so we might need to elevate Tom. And two, John is rumored that he might retire in the ring after Stipe. So instead of going through a division where we don't have a champion, we've already got one. He becomes undisputed, and that's where I have to correct you. That is not the rule. The interim but champion. You, 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 you know how it goes. Yep. Oh, you're never the champion. You just got that belt because you were second. You got the second place. You're never champion. Oh, you're actually going to fight. Now you're going to, you know what I mean? You know how the sure. fans are. You know how this shit gets Fico, sure. right? Where it's like, you know, just, just like, uh, you know, when Dustin Poirier won it, he got the interim champion. And right. it's because, you know, Habib wasn't ready or whatnot. And then he actually fought Habib. And now Dustin was like, I was never the champion. So why, you know, why have that? Like, I, I see what you mean, but I'm looking at like the backlash. If John Jones does retire, then you have the interim champion, Tom Aspinall, who is a number one contender. He becomes the, the the new heavyweight champion of the world, right? It's, it's it's it reminds me of like when Jose Aldo got his belt when at WC a and Robert Conrad goes right. at, at a press conference, and it, Conor McGregor was like, "You didn't win that fucking belt, mate. You got that belt was handed to okay. you. You know what I mean?" So, okay, go ahead, go, go, come back at me. Let me try, stay with me now. Okay, Chip, I I have to finish this thought now. People yeah. believe, all right, Tom, As let's just paint a scenario. Tom Aspinall's in the front row. He's the interim champion. Mm. John Jones and Stipe go fight. John Jones takes the microphone, says, I'm retired. Boom, Aspinall now elevates. John Jones says, I'm not going to retire. And you've got interim champion versus undisputed champion. Wrong, wrong. And you got to look into the bylaws of government affairs. The interim champion can only exist when there is the absence of an undisputed champion. And therefore, the moment the bell rings for John Jones' next fight, there is no longer an interim champion. The moment the bell mm. rings, the undisputed champion has returned, which means Tom Aspinall sitting in the front row with his shiny belt is stripped instantly. So if mm. John does retire, mm. he does not move up. And if they do fight, it's not champion versus champion. And nobody seems to know that. I'm only calling that out because when this gets looked into and Mark Ratner has to weigh in, he's going to weigh in with me. There is no interim champion per the rules when the undisputed champion is present. Wow! Look at look at the case and drop us some full knowledge. It's pretty good though, right? And you're absolutely for the people you know, that care. They'll like that. Yeah. Well, people do care. That's why they want our our insight, our perception of it. Because you are right. The reason why you make an interim champion is because the champion cannot defend. He can't do his thing, right? Some of those ACL. Ah, oh, man, like Jamal Hill. He vacated it. He vacated his title because he goes, I do not want to hold up the division. I'm going to vacate the title. I'll come back. He came back. He had the first opportunity to fight for the belt. He vacated. He came up short. Now Alex Pierre was doing that. Where it wasn't the same thing as John Joe. So 
from what the gangster is saying, when John Jones steps in the cage and defends his belt, Tom Aspinall is no longer the interim champion of the world. That's an interesting. Uh, is Michael? I want you to do some research and look that up. You hear me? That's your homework for the, the week. Yeah, and last one before we get let Joe go. We actually haven't talked about this one on our YouTube yet. Jake Paul versus Mike Tyson is. Does, does this fight get you excited at all? I don't, I don't know what to think of it, but uh, it's on Netflix in July. What what are your thoughts on this highly divisive matchup? I feel like I have my... Th and you said this is my last question. I want to thank you guys. When Demetrius started this and I kept watching all these guests and I wasn't one of... I've been, is he ever going to invite me? So thank you for, for having me on. <laughs> guys, I feel like I have my thumb on top of the, 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 the sport, what, what it wants to see from wrestling to boxing. I feel like that about myself. Now, Jake Paul and Tyson is one you just never imagined. It wasn't going to happen. Yeah. They, they weren't allowed to do it. They, multiple different weight classes involved uh, between a guy that fights at 185 and a former heavyweight. So my point is, it took a little minute to digest. It took a minute to kind of understand what's happening. You know there's something big. You got this Netflix involvement. Now, you and I, Demetrius, need for Netflix to have a positive experience in this space so that they will stick around. And, mm -hmm. I, and I was so worried. Hey, I think they grabbed the wrong one here. I don't think people are going to want to see this. They eventually got Texas just recently last week to actually make it a fight. It w there's a reason to win now because this will go against Tyson's record, which is such a wonderful legacy. And all of a sudden, it starts to feel a little bit more real. Eight rounds, a little too many, I think, for Mike to do well. But two-minute rounds with a one-minute rest, all of a sudden, you start, to, you start to give Mike some real hope here. And boy, does he ever need it. And think about how life is, is going to be for Mike. As, as celebrated as he is just as a human and a figure, imagine the next 20 or 30 years of his time on this planet, how he's going to be looked at, how he's going to be revered. Mm. Mike Tyson is largely for like my, my son, something he's heard about. And my son respects him yeah. and knows that that's a star, but he never saw him. He never saw one of his walkouts or weigh-ins or press conferences or matches. So now it's this whole new demographic where this guy is a legend, but they're going to actually see him. I just think that's exciting. I mean, listen, if Michael Jordan came back, there was so many kids that go, oh. wow, I heard of the greatness, but I can't believe I'm actually going to see it. And he does not want to lose to Jake Paul. I mean, when you're talking about that legacy and how you're going to be remembered, that just isn't the loss that you want. Yeah, I agree with you. My best friend, one of my brothers, texted me. He goes, man, I don't want to see one of my heroes growing up watch box get knocked out. And I was like, well, wait a minute now. You're talking about Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson fought. He just fought Roy Jones Jr. He did a great job. He even fought that. He even did that fight high, if I heard him correctly. <laughs> and he looked damn well good. He's training with some good coaches. And I think we Mike Tyson still got it. He's going to come out there and he's going to surprise us. And I'm happy. I'm, I'm shocked they made it an actual fight and sanctioned it. Um, I think the only thing I'm worried about is Mike Tyson's health getting hit in the head at that age is never uh, the best thing to do but hey you know I think Netflix is smart getting in the business they had their first live stream with the Cat Williams I watched that live and it went very very well so let's see I'm super excited to see how it turns turns out man I, I, I'm pumped for it See, me too. And Demetrius, I think normally you and I would be haters on something like we're MMA guys and this is boxing for one. And then you got this YouTube star. It's like, no, we actually have an open, we actually have an open mind here. They're very smart with the rules. Netflix and the business stamp and that, that kind of adds an element. Let's stand back and see yep. what happens. I, I'm with, I've been invited yeah. to a party for that. Now I believe the date is July 20th, but coach T Cantor invited me to, I have not been invited to a fight party in about five years. So the fact that oh, this is shit. the one <laughs> where a guy's planning this in advance and it's a potluck and my wife and I got to bring this special dip. I mean, I'm just saying that hasn't happened to me in about five years. So there's a part of the population pretty into this match. Boom. Well, you heard it from the gangster. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much to our guest, Chill. Hey, Sonnen is for this coming embarrassing? Is this embarrassing? That's not good. That's a fat guy shirt right there, right? I'm sweating while just sitting here talking to you guys. <laughs> I was watching that form, and I almost, I was even going to grab it and act like, oh, no, I spilled on myself to, to blend it with the audience, but I didn't get to it in time. All right, fine. It's hot in this room. You know, I can't believe this. The greatest of all time, the greatest of all time was nice to me. I didn't think it was going to be that way today. And I really appreciate that. That's the humility. See, Demetrius doesn't know how we all look at him. He stayed humble. He doesn't understand that he's up here. Thank you, fellas. You guys are awesome. Appreciate you, Chuck. Ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this episode of the Mighty Cast, make sure you leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And also, go 
on YouTube and follow my man Chael Sonnen. And check out his uh, his show, DC and the Bad Guy. Check it out. It's streaming on ESPN, bad Spotify, where you get your... Uh, oh, my bad. Bad Guy and the other guy. That show Daniel, got canceled. Daniel the Cormier. Daniel Cormier. They call him uh, DC is what... Oh, DC, Cormier. good guy. Yeah. Fuck. What he happened in the description, God damn it. He was, he was a fighter. He's pretty good, too. Pretty good fighter, this guy. <laughs> Boom. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, we are out. We'll see you next time. Chill. Well, damn. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to an episode of Recap. Is where me and Michael, we break down what we just... Oh, no, yeah, honestly, we, you bring up now. We have, we have, the, we have the results. Let me, pull, let me pull up the poll. Of what we should call this segment. Okay, okay. So, here are the final poll results. We have over a thousand votes. Hey! Dr drum, drum roll, please. Give me, give me. <laughs> drum roll. Uh, yeah, and the, might, the mighty recap is your winner. 62% hey. of the votes. Let's and no, you, you were you were right about Mighty Cap. That all the top comment is like Mighty Cap sounds like you're about to have a podcast full of lies. <laughs> <laughs> hey, who knows? Down the road we can do that. Do like a Mighty Cap where we just talk about all the lies <laughs> in MMA. Like, there ain't no way in hell that happened. Da, 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 da. No, that just sounds like something MMA guru would do. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so so I will say the another option was leaving some comments with uh, some of the names that they like. Let's just read these for fun, but I, I think Mighty Recap is is probably good. But Mighty Rewind got got a lot of likes. You you don't you're not a fan of that? No, I'm not a fan of that one. No. Mighty Rewind, Rewind, Mighty Run, Rundown, Mighty Rerun, the Mouse Cap. <laughs> I don't like that at all. I don't like that. Mighty, I think the Mighty Wind, um, Mighty. After hours, <laughs> <laughs> I like mighty after hours. That's kind of dope. Having mighty a drink, after hours. yeah, mighty uh, after hours. This is mighty <sighs> reflection. Um, ah, where's the one I saw that there was one? Ah, there was one that was so funny that I wonder if this guy deleted it. But he's like, you should make it mighty back shots. Because <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? mighty, mighty back, back shots. I, he's like, yeah, it's, I, I it's think that's fun. for only fans. Uh, I gotta find that one. Oh no, that's what he said. He said because of only fans. Yeah, that's 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 an OnlyFans thing. Uh, Which yeah, no, let's let's give OnlyFans some yeah. What is going on, guys? Welcome to my OnlyFans page. I'm gonna be posting exclusive content. Some of the content I'm gonna be posting nobody has ever seen before, like my archives of all the training videos I've done in my whole entire career. Also, me posting about my diet my recovery and some back behind the scene of my jiu-jitsu and when i go to competition make sure you guys subscribe we're gonna be posting exclusively on OnlyFans. so you now we're, we're gonna go officially this this segment is called mighty recap so now hey. now you can give it that that proper that proper introduction Okay, with well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of Mighty Recap. Thank you to the fans who uh, voted to get this segment of the show named Mighty Recap. Um, I think it's good because after we get done talking to Chell, there's stuff that, or not just Chell, but our guests, there's stuff that kind of, you know, stays with us. And we're like, oh, interesting. I think for me, like I told Chell, him paving the way for the entertain well how he how you put it there's the competition side of it and there's the entertainment side of it and i think he did a very good job of the entertainment side of it you know getting athlete getting fans to care because i remember when uh anderson, uh, anderson silva was on his reign when he knocked out Vito burford when he was just beating everybody not until chael sonic came into his life in the mma world and talked all that trash and created drama that's where his stardom rose and even dana white said it he goes you need a good guy and you need a bad guy and for anderson silva you needed that bad guy you look at batman all of his bad guys or all of his enemies aren't ever compared to the joker without batman there is no joker without superman there is no lex luther the list is just going on without no wolverine there is no saber tooth right so i think chill Sonnet was the forefront of that 
entertainment side in mixed martial arts. And I love everything he did when it came to that. He's invested the money over the years of his career of fighting, being an analyst working at ESPN, and into his own studio at his house where he just jump on and boom, turn on a light switch and go, where I've done the same thing. And he also has an amazing producer because they seem to be vibing out as me and you, we vibe out, we look at, see the landscape, what we want to talk about. Um, so I think that's why it's worked very well. And I think the interesting thing uh, about him is that he, he can talk about whatever you want and how he put it as as an analyst you can participate without throwing a punch because you're looking at it as an analyst he started as a fan and he ended as a fan and i think he has the gift of gab when he gets behind it mike he can just let it he can just cook just let him cook and you're going to be entertained and i and i've always been entertained big fan of his youtube channel as well and his his show with uh daniel cormier i can't believe i got that wrong i thought it was good guy and the bad guy or his dc yeah, no yeah so it's it's good guy i think he, to be honest with you, I don't even know if he knew the correct name of the show, but it's good. <laughs> it's good. It's good guy, bad guy. Um, ch check that out um, on ESPN MMA YouTube, also on ESPN Plus. Um, still got a lot of friends out there, and I think it's it's really cool seeing DC and Chael together because it's it's something I I always wanted to see. Because remember back in the day when when uh, Ariel was at ESPN, yep. he had the Ariel and the bad guy, but then he also had the DC and Helwani. So it's it's kind of combining both those worlds. So see, I I, yeah. I I love the Ariel and the, and, uh, the bad guy because. Chael Sonnen had the entertainment side of it where you had Eri Holwani. He loves the entertainment side, but he's also a big, big fan of the competition side as well where he wants to see you know the competition play out over the entertainment side. So I felt at that time when that show was going on, it was magnificent because you had those guys actually getting arguments. Like they, It's almost like that Skip Bayless versus Shannon Sharp a dynamic duo where Skip Bayless would get hella pissed off when he said, you're not one of the greatest of all time. He goes, how you going to say that? Huh? You never played a day in the life of football and you going to sit here and just dis disrespect me. He goes, I'm not disrespecting you. I'm just telling you how I think. He goes, I'm about to whoop your motherfucking ass. That's what's about to happen. John has made it very clear he doesn't want this oh, fight. stop it. He's also made it clear that he will. Stop it. No, excuse me. He's made it clear. Excuse me. I got to finish the thought before you disagree with it. He's made it very clear he does not want this fight. But I, I think I think for Chael to have an amazing career and then not you know he was never a world champion in MMA excuse me he was never a world champion in UFC but I think for him to be able to take his career like you look at all the guys I always talk I always I'm a big fan of this and I'm always a big advocate for it excuse me is that when you're done with your career while you're in your career build your brand that way when you stop competing or whatever it is you're doing you can still monetize or still be part of the discussion and. I've taken a huge inspiration from him, Joe Rogan, about building this podcast. And once again, thank you to the fans who tune into this episode and all the episodes in the YouTube channel. We're, we're, we're doing our best to expand the brand and, and to get some other guests on here that just aren't in mixed martial arts. We got a great a gamer, Asthma Gold. I'm talking to a donut operator right now. Um, we got a lot of stuff in the pipeline, and I just want to take time and thank you guys. And Chelsea has done a good job, like he said, Michael paving the way for us to have a, a platform as MMA guys to speak our, 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 our create a channel. And um, shout out to Chell for doing that, man. And ladies and gentlemen, if you enjoyed this uh, part of the Mighty Recap, please leave a like, subscribe. Also, hit the bell to know when we drop another one. And comment down below, what part of this podcast surprised you the most? For me, I will say his upbringing when he went, skipped school, told his dad, got the VHS, and now was kind of his, his entry into mixed martial arts. I've heard about the stories back in the day where there was no coach, kind of like with Misha Tate, there was no coach, but there was somebody above them where here there was no coach because it was just brought up to 1993 and yes ladies and gentlemen i did horrible math it wasn't 21 years it was 31 years my apologies and uh as always i'm your host Demis johnson my co-host michael wands over that shit my camera's gonna die so <laughs> all right all right michael go ahead close it out close it out michael go ahead do it <laughs> all right ladies and gentlemen all right all right ladies and gentlemen uh, shout out to the, our guest, Michael. Oh, Jesus Christ. All right. Uh, shout out to Chell Sonnen for joining the Mighty Cast. If you guys enjoyed this episode of the Mighty Cast, please leave a like, subscribe. Also, hit the bell to go live and let me know in the comment what you thought was the best part of the show. I'm your host, Mish Johnson, and that is my host, Michael Wontober. His battery's about to die. We'll see you at the next one. Cheer! Well, damn.